Well, welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Preston Robert Tisch Institute for Global Sports Chalk Talk. Uh, I'm Professor Cameron Myler. I'm a clinical assistant professor in the Tisch Institute where I teach law and Olympic sport governance among other things. I'm also a lawyer. I'm on the Court of Arbitration for Sport and my first career was as Olympic athlete in the sport of luge. So today I am delighted to be hosting this conversation with the esteemed Dick Pound. And I have to say, like uh, trying to figure out how to condense a bio for you, Dick, was really challenging. But I'm going to just uh, go over some of the highlights of an incredible uh, career in sport. So a few things I read about you. Uh, the positive contribution made by Dick Pound to the world of sport in general and anti-doping in particular cannot be overstated. A lawyer by profession, he was instrumental in the establishment of the World Anti-Doping Agency more than 20 years ago and served as the agency's founding president. In that time and against the odds, he, saw, he oversaw the drafting and implementation of the World Anti-Doping Code, which for the first time managed to harmonize the rules across sports and nations of the world. Uh, and what uh, was a stellar athletic and sports administration career, that is perhaps one of his greatest achievements, but certainly not the only one. Uh, he's also been a longstanding member of the International Olympic Committee. Uh, Dick is also an Olympic athlete in the sport of luge, uh, competing for Canada. He was swimming, director. swimming, you're the loser. Oh, oh my gosh, I meant swimming. I was thinking swimming there are, and I said- There are other sports besides luge. Why there are not other sports? <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so swimming, swimming. Uh, Dick was a director of the organizing committees for the Olympic Games in Calgary in 1988 and uh, Vancouver in 2010. He's been named by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Uh, and uh, to wrap things up, uh, he's been described as an engaging statesman, a negotiation genius, and a crisis management expert. And Dick also wanted me to point out that um, uh, he is a good dancer and has nice teeth. So uh, to just to, and, and I, one of the things I appreciate uh, has an excellent sense of humor and is a great conversationalist. So I'm, I'm really excited, Dick, to, uh, to have you here with us this evening. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. So uh, fun to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think we have to start off with uh, kind of the obvious question and just get that one uh, out of the way. Uh, so, you know, as we all know, COVID-19 pandemic has caused the postponement of the Olympic and Paralympic Games from last summer, 2020, to this summer. And the opening ceremonies are four months away uh, from yesterday. So July 23rd, they are set to begin. So what are your thoughts? Are the games going to happen? Well, I mean, it's, it's hard to, to read the tea leaves, but uh, from everything we can tell right now, uh, we're good to go. Uh, the, uh, they've, there have had to be some adjustments made to accommodate the Japanese public health authorities. And that is unfortunately that there won't be any foreign spectators uh, at the games. And that's, that's too bad because while, while spectators aren't must-haves, they're, they're nice-to-haves, and, and, and certainly for those who follow the Olympics uh, semi-religiously, uh, the opportunity to be there is, again, half the fun, even, even though realistically, and you don't want the purists to uh, get away with that, but I mean, you can actually see it better on television than you can live, and, uh, but uh, be that as it may, that's, uh, that's one of the uh, issues we've had to deal with, and there's some mechanical aspects of that too, which is how do the folks that paid up money last year get their money back? And uh, that, the, the, the devil will be in the detail there. I imagine so. And I'm curious, how do you think that will, you know, having no foreign spectators in the, in the venues, how will that impact the commercial partners of the games, the, the broadcast partners like NBC and the top sponsors like Coke and Visa, what are their views on an Olympics with no spectators other than those from Japan? Well, I, I, I really don't think that the 99.5% of the people in the world that will experience the Olympics really care whether there's somebody in the stands or not. You can, you can generate noise. We've seen that in 
some of the professional sports uh, that are uh, being practiced uh, as we speak without um, crowds or without significant crowds at least. So that's not going to make too much difference to them. And, and uh, the reach from a, a sponsor and an advertiser perspective will be unaffected by the fact that a few thousand spectators from overseas won't be there. What about from the athlete's perspective? You've, you've competed, I've competed. It's, a, it's, it's really a, a, an amazing and, and unique experience at the Olympic Games. How do you think it'll impact the athletes? Well, you know, I, I would have thought you heading down a loose track wouldn't care too much about spectators. You're trying to get down there without killing yourself. And I'm trying to get from one end of the swimming pool to, to another. So I'm kind of focused on my lane and, and um, getting up and back without drowning. So it, it's it, it's not, I, I think it's it more likely to be a, a distraction than, than uh, a stimulant for the, uh, for the athletes. Uh, it, I think, it, I mean, it can be a bit of a distraction. I do recall in Calgary, I, I drew number one in the in the race. So I was the first one off and I was sitting at the start handles and I heard someone at the bottom of the start ramp yell my name. And I was like, wait, what? What's happening? Okay, now I have to like, this is- Have I got a ticket? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so on uh, Dick, on the topic of athletes, uh, the, the Olympic Village in Tokyo is, uh, you know, ca- has the capacity to host or you know, house nearly 20,000 people. So, you know, about 11,000 athletes and then coaches and support staff and all sorts of other folks. What is, what is that going to look like during the games? Uh, because with so many people, it seems like social distancing might be a bit of a challenge. It, it, it will certainly be a challenge. And, and uh, I think what you try and do is get as much prevention uh, involved as, as safe distancing and whatnot. So I personally, I think you have to be out of your mind to go to the games as an athlete or team official without having been vaccinated. Uh, you'll certainly be tested before you get on a, an air- aircraft to Tokyo. You'll be tested when you arrive and you won't get out of the airport unless you're, you're COVID free. And then you're going to be in this bubble. You're not going to be running around, uh, uh, the way athletes might uh, ordinarily do in Tokyo and the Ginza and having lots of fun. You'll be going to and from the village and, and, and your training or competition venues. So I, I think the, the opportunities for, for spreading uh, in, a, in a positive sense or, or being infected will be minimized to, to the point where, you know, it's not really a safety hazard. On the, uh, on, the, on the issue of vaccines, what are your thoughts about whether athletes should have priority over other individuals to get vaccinated so they can go uh, to the Olympic Games? And then just a follow on question, what about uh, athletes who, are, who live in countries where perhaps vaccines aren't available for anyone? How, uh, how do we deal with those issues? Well, uh, to do the last uh, question first, I think there's going to be a lot of international cooperation as we get down the road a bit in, in, the, in the sense of have countries uh, will, will help with the supply of a vaccine. Uh, the Japanese organizers may do the same. Uh, China has offered uh, its vaccine, which, you know, depending on whether it's an, an accepted vaccine in, in country X or Y um, might, might help. In terms of the priority, you know, I don't think any Olympic athlete that I've ever run into would say, put me at the top of the list. They say, look, there, there are a lot of people that really need to be vaccinated, the, the first care responders, the health workers, the, the, the vulnerable, older population and so on. But, but let's say all those emergency cases take up 25% of your population, which is unlikely. After that, each country's got to figure out what, it, what its uh, process will be to, to deal with the, the rest of the population. And I'd say that the, the experience I've seen over the years is that most countries are really proud of their Olympic athletes and they want them to do well and, and they, they would not want to put them in harm, <clears throat> harm's way without as much protection as possible. So I, I suspect that somewhere in, in the 
in the plan for each uh, country, you'll say, all right, we're sending, we're sending a whole bunch of folks here uh, into practically the epicenter of uh, this pandemic. It makes sense uh, for us to uh, invest in vaccinating them so that they're, they can stay healthy and compete well. And I, it, you know, it's, you're not talking about a, a huge number, uh, you know, even in the United States, what your team's gonna be what, 500 athletes or maybe six and, and, uh, and they're not all gonna be there at the same time. And so I, I think we will find a way and, 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 and people will, will accept that as, as, a, as a genuine con consideration the same way you would with your diplomatic corps or your, your armed forces uh, going into places like this. You, you, you want them to be as healthy as they can when they arrive and remain as healthy as they can while they're there. Let's see, I'm looking in the chat, I think we've got a couple of related questions. Uh, so one question, uh, how, if there were to be a, let's say an outbreak of uh, positive COVID tests of athletes or other you know, participants in and around the games, what, uh, what's the contingency plan for that? How would, uh, how would the organizing committee deal with that, do you think? Well, I think one of the ways will be testing, whether it's every couple of days or even every day, because some of the fast tests now are pretty, uh, you know, pretty minimally invasive. So you 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 make sure that nobody's got it. If if somebody does test positive, boom, they're into isolation right away. Uh, the minute that's detected, and and you know you you insulate them and and the other athletes from each other. So. I think that logistical exercise can probably be accomplished pretty well by then. And we're, you know, we got four months to go. We're going, to, we're going to know twice as much in four months as we do today about this virus and the variants. I, I hope so. Uh, let's see. So uh, another question from the audience. And uh, again, folks, if anyone has uh, questions, please feel free to either in the in the chat or Q and A, and I'll, I'll do my best to uh, to field as many as we can. Uh, so, a question: uh, Polls by the AP show that about eighty percent of the Japanese public believe they uh, the game should be canceled or postponed again. Uh, do you think the local um, population will boycott the games or protest uh, in in some way? I, I don't think so. Um, I mean, personally, I'd rather rely on up to date scientific uh, information that, that, you, that you get from the public health authorities and, and, and not rely on a poll of 11 or 1200 people who none of whom will be uh, experts in, uh, in contagious diseases to, to make up uh, their mind. I suspect, although I don't know, that, that the, the news that, that there won't be foreign spectators or, or, foreign, or a minimum of foreign officials uh, will ease some of that concern. Uh, I think you know, Japan has, has declared a, a state of emergency, which is probably, a, it sounds a little more serious than it really is in Japan because they've been pretty good about controlling it. But so that they're, you know, they don't have to worry about um, incoming uh, positive cases. Uh, I think that may ease the angst uh, somewhat. And I think as, as time goes on, the, uh, the Japanese public health authorities will have to educate population a little better uh, you know it's, it's hard to it's hard to declare a state of emergency and then say oh everything's fine so, so what have we done about it uh, they've been they've been slow in Japan about approving a vaccine but I gather that's been done now or certifying whatever their expression is and it's it's being administered to, as we speak and, and I, I assume that will ramp up as, as time goes on do, do you think it's so another uh, question from the audience, uh, and this is from one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Daniel Kelly. Uh, he asks, uh, what do you believe will be the impact of the vaccine distribution on the potential to change the, the IOCs and the organizing committee's thoughts on having foreign fans being able to attend the competitions? Well, uh, my feeling is that ship has sailed. I think they've they've made that decision, and the IOC, after consulting with you know the the Olympic family 
component of the uh, equation have, have say, say we, we can live with that and, and then that's a call that your public health authorities have to have to make. Uh, I think they'd be more concerned if, if you know, the, uh, the restriction applied to a country with which Japan does not have good relations or something like that. But this, this is, a, uh, I think, a, a science-based, um, public authority-based decision. Not, it's not political. So uh, okay. I, I, don't, I don't think that's going to be an issue. And do you know, Dick, and this is a follow-up question from uh, Dr. Kelly, uh, as will it be possible for spectators from other countries or it, visitors from other countries to go to Japan and just kind of have a, like the third party experience in, you know, bars and restaurants and, and just being in Tokyo during the games? Do you know if, if uh, Japan will be allowing any visitors in the, in the country? I don't know whether they've they've made that decision yet. Uh, certainly, they would. They, you wouldn't get out of the airport without being tested. Right. And and if you want to get down on the Ginza and frolic with with the uh, the local folk, I mean that's up to you. But uh, I must say that, that even as a, a an Olympic fan, uh, I would not want to go if I couldn't get into the the venues and and, and spectate. I, but it, you can save a lot of money and a lot of risk staying at home watching it on uh, N NBC. This is true. Um, on the topic of hospitality, uh, a question from uh, the former head of Olympic sponsorship at Visa, uh, Michael Lynch. So will the IOC and or the Tokyo Organizing Committee for the Olympic Games have to pay back sponsors rights fees uh, if they haven't delivered access to the premium hospitality and other benefits that the sponsors have paid for? Well, I, I think a lot of that will depend on the relationship between uh, the sponsors and, and, and the IOC. Uh, they're not losing an awful lot of commercial value here. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're not having the opportunity to, to run an expensive hospitality program. I don't know how that would impact on the, the, the number of eyeballs, uh, uh, you know, watching the games or, or the, the payment systems that are being used, uh, even in Japan. So there, my guess is there's probably not a lot of lost, lost value and, and there would be a loss of a lot of headaches looking after a bunch of pampered guests. So it, it may be as broad as it's long. I mean, not, not including yourself, of course, right? Oh, heavens no. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. Let's see. Uh, we've got all sorts of questions. Uh, I'll, I'll get to as many as I can again. Uh, so a question from uh, one of my uh, students, uh, Tian, uh, who would like to ask about how COVID-19 has impacted the process for countries to bid and host the Olympic Games in the future? And do you think there will be more of a focus on what the force majeure clauses include? Um, yeah, I think, you know, we're, we, this hasn't happened for a hundred years. So this, uh, nobody in living memory can, can recall a Spanish uh, flu uh, days, but uh, um, it, it's certainly on the radar now. I know I've been in, in, in speeches and writings that I've done in the last three or four years and say, you know, you've got to face the, the, the prospect of conflict in, in certain areas that would make it too dangerous to go to the games. And, and, and frankly, pandemics may be the new wars. And then so you now have to build that, um, that assessment into things. And, and one hopes that all of the world governments have figured out that, uh, You've got to have a, a distant early warning system out there for pandemics and, and be able to respond effectively and quickly uh, whenever there's any, any serious potential for a pandemic to, to develop. And that'll be, I'm sure, you know, as you have a coordination commission established for each edition of the games, um, th there will be a medical expert on that from now on to make sure that the these sorts of things are, are being considered to assess the, 
uh, even at the in the discussion stage before you you end up with preferred candidates, um, an assessment of the the state of readiness of the public health authorities in the prospective host country. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so related uh, question uh, from a friend of mine who works at NBC, uh, who asks as the costs and risks for Olympic host cities seem to become more and more imposing, what are your thoughts about a perennial Olympic site, be it in Switzerland or somewhere else? Yeah, that's we've jumped off that bridge many times in the past, and and uh, I think our our the collective view around the IOC and and probably around the the, the sports world is is that uh, the Olympics don't just belong to one country. They're, they're they're you know they're they're universal now, and 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 every country that can conceivably think about hosting should have that opportunity to uh, put themselves forward. The other thing, of course, is that, you know, as, as time goes on, the, the, the technical requirements of sports change. Remember, in, you know, in Calgary, uh, only the, the daredevil, you know, athletes would go off a 90 meter jump. Okay. Now the kids do that. If you, if you don't have a 120 meter jump, uh, you're chopped liver. The, the tracks and the pools and the equipment are all changing all the time. So it brings up the, the, the question of who's gonna pay for all this? In, in the the three years and 11 months between editions of the Olympic games. It's gonna be Greece, you know, if that's where you, uh, you know, romantically go back to uh, uh, to Greece as the starting point, uh, you know, is Greece capable of, of, of handling this? Uh, and, you know, think, think of the discussion in your Congress where they say, well, right, we need to approve this bill because our share of maintaining the Olympic site in, name the country is a uh, hundred million dollars this year. And you can imagine the yowling and whining that will go on in, in you know, 205 countries around the world uh, about sending our money to this country to, to maintain facilities. So I, I, my guess is we're gonna stick with the, uh, the idea of rotating the games, or, but be a lot more, um, conscious of, of the, the issues and, and a lot more conscious of, of not getting into huge um, construction of, of facilities that don't exist, you know, which that's one of the things that led to the, you know, the, the, the infamous and unverified $50 billion price tag for um, uh, Sochi in, in 2014. I mean, they, they built an entire winter sports structure and you know as i remember at the time the russians were saying well yeah it, we, the alps you know there's been lots of skiing in the alps for 100 years so we don't have any of that we have to build it uh, in order to to have this for the future and, and of course for the games and and uh, you've got to you got to be able to separate olympic related costs from general infrastructure investments that uh, that a host country would like to make but now the, the focus is as much as possible on the, the use of existing um, and temporary facilities. Do you think uh, yeah. given all of the pressures of COVID on, on sports and, and the Olympic games, do you think this is an opportunity for the IOC to sort of reimagine what the Olympic games look like? Fewer, maybe fewer athletes or fewer events or what changes do you do you see coming, perhaps? I, th I think one of the the jobs that we have to do is is to is to reassess the entire sport program, not not just the Olympic. Uh, and, you know, the seasons are getting longer and longer and longer, and, and it's harder in many of the sports to stay healthy uh, mm -hmm. and, and injury free in, in a longer season. So that's something that has to be rationalized. And there are a lot of there are a lot of events out there that frankly, don't mean much uh, and, and don't contribute to the, uh, the development of sport uh, around the world. So uh, look at that. Uh, on the other hand, you know, you've got this really exciting cauldron into which you, you put you know, 11,000 athletes for a couple of weeks uh, a year, well, two and a half weeks uh, every four years. 
that's pretty special. And, and the scarcity of that makes it even more special. So I, I, th I think the idea is, right, at least in the, in the summer games, to, to have a, a 10,500 athlete cap and a, and a give or take 300 event uh, program. In summer, you know, if you're a, if you're a really bad sprinter, you, you know, you have 12 seconds of fun in the 100 meters. Uh, but others start, uh, you know, it's, especially in some of the team sports, they start on day one and, and, and don't finish until uh, day 17 or 16 at least. On, on that issue, will athletes have to leave the Olympic Village in Tokyo after they complete their events? So they're... That's it. That seems to be the plan now that, you know, within a day or so of, of you, you finishing your event, uh, you're on a plane and you're, you're not gonna stay around if you're, you know, if the swimming's in week one, you're, you're all finished and then you, you, you become a tourist for the next week, you'll, you'll be a television spectator at home. So, you know, I, I think as soon as you, uh, you, you get your medal, the, the clock starts to run. And that's, I think that's sensible and from a health perspective, it's not, as much fun, but if you if you put the question to uh, to Olympic athletes saying, well, uh, would you rather not have games or have games where once you finished your event uh, you, you go back home? I think you'd have almost unanimous uptake on those. So let's have the games. That's that's more important than than me being able to watch another sport. All right. Thank you. So uh, some questions from the audience here. I seem to be getting some feedback. Uh, so one, uh, Dick, from someone you know, uh, Terrence Burns, who <laughs> asks, uh, Dick, you were instrumental in defining the Olympic brand 20 years ago for the IOC's marketing partners. What do you think is the state of the Olympic brand today? And what is its biggest, biggest challenge? I think the brand is, is, is still as strong as it ever has been. Uh, I think people realize more and more how special the Olympics are and, and what they stand for in terms of international sport, and aspirational sport for, uh, for the athletes and, and, uh, and the value that they can deliver to uh, sponsors. Uh, the, the big threat is, is that you've got to keep that ethical component of the Olympic movement uh, up and not just turn, you know, Olympic sports into entertainment. They can be entertaining but you don't want it to become entertainment so that's a that's a constant struggle to make sure you pick the right sponsors that they understand what they're buying into uh, as olympic sponsors they have a responsibility uh, as well to to contribute to the brand i mean and, and as terence knows the, the, basically the whole concept of the olympic marketing program was was to take a recognized commercial brand a Coca-Cola, a Visa, whatever it, it may be, and link it to the Olympic brand in the hope that the, the whole becomes greater than the sum of the parts. And that's, so that's a constant, uh, a, a constant effort to keep that, uh, that brand out there and, and relevant. Uh, make sure you can, you can get it down as, as far down in the, in the age group um, of, of a, a world or country population as possible, so that you get uh, you, you get your younger generation consuming the Olympics, and, and therefore, uh, at least in our kind of uh, society, being exposed to the brands that uh, the sponsors are are hoping will occur. And we've got to make sure we. I mean, the number of platforms on which you now consume the Olympics is is legion. And, and, and so we've got to respond to that in, in, in getting a message out there on the social and, and interactive uh, media. But Terence, uh, who, who posed the question, was one of the, the real inventors of uh, Olympic marketing. I am, uh, so there's so many great questions in the chat and uh, I'm trying to uh, link uh, themes together here. So uh, also related to uh, to marketing and brands, but on the athlete side, uh, Dick, so with with athletes becoming, an in, uh, becoming increasingly focused on their personal brands and marketing strategy, what are your thoughts on rule 40 
and uh, how it allows brands to continue to utilize athletes in marketing campaigns, but protects Olympic ring holders. Well, one of the things that we're, we're looking at, and it's, it's, it's kind of an outcome of the, uh, you know, the Olympic agenda 2020 plus five that we reviewed at our, our recent uh, IOC session is, is to find a way to, to allow Olympic athletes to, to kind of link themselves to the uh, Olympics um, during the time between games. And I think if that's, if that's handled properly and, 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 uh, and appropriately, uh, it, it can actually give more value to the, uh, uh, the Olympic rings as a brand. What you don't want it to do is become politicized. And, uh, but if, you know, to the extent that, that the Olympics can help athletes stay able to compete longer by being able to uh, afford to you know, push off uh, you know, the rest of their lives by another four years or something like that, if we can help, um, I think that's, that's a good addition to the, to the mix. Well, speaking of politics in the Olympic Games, uh, what are your thoughts on Rule 50? Uh, and I think many people in the in the audience likely know what Rule 50 is, but it's a rule in the Olympic Charter, which uh, imposes some restrictions on what athletes uh, can and can't do in the sports venues and on the medal podiums, such as making any kind of political protests or uh, demonstrations. So there's been a lot of discussion around that in the in sort of the this past year. And uh, Dick, what are what are your thoughts about Rule 50? Is it is it necessary? Should it be changed? What uh, what do you think? Well, it, you know, there's a lot of study and thought going into this. It's sort of being coordinated from, from an Olympic perspective by the, the IOC Athletes Commission, which has consulted thousands and thousands of athletes around the world. And I think that most athletes, as they, as they focus on this, realize that the, the restrictions are not what some of them have been marketed to be, which is a, a, um, a removal of your right to have an opinion and, and to express it. You, you're, you're free to do that. We just say the field of play. You, know, you, you don't want to have somebody elbowing another athlete because they have, have some political um, difficulties with the, the, the country from which that athlete comes. And you don't, want, you, you don't want to interfere with the competition. My view is that the competition isn't really over until the, the, the medals have been presented. So I, I view the, the podium as field of play. And once, you know, all you're, you're asked to, to do is, is to withhold expression of that uh, opinion for a few minutes. After, you know, in press conferences and in interviews and whatever, man, you, you can say whatever you want. As long as somebody uh, in our business says, you know, uh, if you say this about that country, uh, you could be in trouble. Not from us, from, from the host country or, or you know, risk of, of libel or defamation. So, you know, say what you think, but uh, understand there are some, some uh, risks accompanying it. And I think that's a reasonable restriction, frankly. I mean, uh, you know, even, even in my country, we have a, char a charter of rights and it says, you know, you're, you're free to express all of these opinions subject to the limit, limitations that come with a, a free and democratic country. And, and, and to wait for five minutes for a medal presentation is not a massive infringement on your human rights. Okay. And the other thing is it's, it's pretty ar articulate, inarticulate rather. I mean, if you swan about on the, uh, on the medal podium, what are people watching think you're protesting. I mean, is it, is it, is it fluoride in the water? Is it, you know, what, uh, what really are you protesting about? So it doesn't actually mean anything. And so the, the rule would not prohibit athletes from voicing their opinions about any social or other issue that they care about at a press conference, for example. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's just that you don't want to interfere with the field of play. That's, that's, you know, the question is, is why are we here? 
you know, we're here to see how we can do against the best in the world. And, and, and we respect everybody who's on the field of play and, and there's, we shouldn't be ruining their moment in the sun uh, uh, on, on the medal podium. It's, it's, it's disrespectful to other athletes, but you, you can have your opinions and, and, and you're free to express them you know, with, with the limitations that I, I just mentioned. All right, I'm going to shift gears a little bit to anti-doping. Uh, so there, there have definitely been some challenges of testing athletes during the pandemic. Um, do you think athletes have taken advantage of this period of you know, lessened uh, scrutiny from the anti-doping agencies? I'm, I'm sure there are some who have, um, but you know, th there's a trace. Uh, and there's two things. There's there are traces now, we, and we're going to keep these samples for 10 years and can identify uh, whatever the impacts may be of ha having used the drug. And um, well, there was one other thing I was going to say. Uh, oh, yes. When you're doping, somebody else knows. Somebody else knows. And, and there are whistleblowers uh, and, and, and avenues now for whistleblowers to, uh, to expose doping that they know about. And, and you're not just limited to the, the lottery of, of finding the right athlete at the right time and testing them uh, at a time when they're undergoing a doping uh, program. It's race day drugs like stimulants, that's easy. I mean, you just, you find those on the, on the day that it happens, but the, a steroid or an EPO program that you've been on for a number of months and have come off, no metabolites left, but uh, you've got the benefit of, of um, the steroid or, or the enhanced blood supply. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so you need to have the out of competition testing as a deterrent and you need to have investigations and, and informed investigations so you can target uh, likely uh, dopers. So it's getting better, but it's not, uh, I, you know, people often ask me, Wait, when do you declare the victory in the, in the fight against doping in sport? <laughs> and the answer is, you're not going to be able to change human nature. There will always be some out there that, that really don't care what they promised or what the rules are or what the risks are. Uh, but if you can convince 99.x percent of the athletes not to dope and give them reasonable assurance that somehow or other you'll catch the ones that are, then I think you have a, a victory, a, a practical victory. This is coming from the former head of WADA. So, uh, so let's, uh, let's hope that's the aspiration, right? Um, <laughs> so uh, let's see, question from a, a Luge a colleague of mine. Uh, so how will the postponement of Tokyo uh, 2020 uh, impact preparations for Beijing, which th those games are now only six months after the summer games. Well, it, it'll be a, a squeeze for sure. Uh, but, uh, you know, don't forget that until 1992, we had two games in, in mm -hmm. the Olympic years. You know, one, in, one starting before the cheering on the Super Bowl was finished and, and another in the summer. So, it has been done um, before, and then, and, you know, fortunately it's in, in different countries. But uh, I'd say one, one of the reassuring things now is, is the, the host broadcast uh, organization, which is so vital to getting the, the Olympics out there uh, through the world, is, is now switching to much more of a cloud-based uh, technology and delivery. So you, you're not going to have to have the, the huge studios and, and, and things that uh, have, have been recent hallmarks of, uh, of Olympic broadcasting. And so I, I, I think when the, the first postponement uh, decision was made, Olympic broadcast services was probably pretty nervous about being able to unwire Tokyo and rewire uh, Beijing in, in the space of six months. But now, you're not going to have that uh, kind of a logistical hardware a kind of problem. And, and so it, it looks to me like it, that will be feasible. Excellent. 
questions from a friend of mine from uh, Lake Placid from years, years and years ago. Uh, to what extent uh, has the IOC or will the IOC uh, help support Japan financially you know, with respect to expenses that the, the country and organizing committee have incurred uh, as a result of uh, the postponement of the games? You mean the marginal expenses since since postponement? Yep. Um, I, I think uh, one of the ways is to is to keep the uh, the sponsors involved so that the, the, you know, there's not going to be a loss of uh, either support or, or or funds. So that in, in a sense that's kind of found found money. Uh, we we will you know we'll restrict the hospitality stuff. We'll restrict the number of uh, uh, of people coming, which will cut back on that. But Basically, when, when the Japanese su suggested postponement, they acknowledged that there would be costs to that. And, and, and the, most of those, the lion's share will be borne by Japan and renegotiating leases for facilities and, and all that sort of stuff and, 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 and keeping the organizing committee members available. You know, many of them are, are, are of the very senior organizers have been seconded from uh, Japanese industry, and so they've they've had to be kept in place for an extra year. Those are costs that they recognized, and 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 I think their value judgment was that it's worth absorbing those, so that we can benefit from the huge infrastructural and other organizational aspects of the games that it, that are already sunk costs, if you like. Let's see. Scanning the many questions here. Um, well, I actually, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to turn back to a, a question that I had for you. Uh, so about the recently passed uh, Empowering Olympic, Paralympic and Amateur Athletes Act of, of 2020 here in the, in the U.S. So signed into law late uh, last year, among other things that uh, that statute establishes safeguards that are designed to protect amateur athletes from abuse by coaches and other officials in you know, Olympic and Paralympic sports. Uh, it requires the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee to give the US Center for Safe Sport, which is the entity adjudicating cases of sexual mm -hmm. abuse in Olympic sport, uh, $20 million annually to support uh, the work that uh, the Safe Sport Center is doing. But the Dick, I think the, the question I have for you is that among other things, the law allows Congress, it gives Congress the power to remove members of the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee Board of Directors, and also the ability to decertify national governing bodies if they fail to you know, adhere to any requirements of the, of the statute. So we have that. And also uh, we know that the, that the IOC definitely prohibits any interference by governments in the workings of, of national Olympic committees. So what kind of problems is this going to cause for, uh, for the US uh, with respect to the IOC? That remains to be seen. I mean, your, your Congress has a rather Ptolemaic view of the world and, and, and thinking that the world revolves around the Congress and, and all I had to do was read the Olympic Charter to, to know that this was going to be a problem. Uh, it's been a problem in Italy, and, and the, the Italians, as hosts, uh, have had to you know, get some dispensation from the, uh, the legislation that was adopted in Italy, and, and one hopes that the, uh, those advising uh, members of Congress will make that point to them. I mean, frankly, why did you have to say that if you're the Congress? You can just do it. And, and you wouldn't you wouldn't be offside in terms of uh, legislation. You you if you stepped in to to, to disband the U.S. OPC, uh, you know you, you, there are consequences to all of that, and and they've got to understand it. But uh, I mean most of most of the elements of it, safe sport and, and all that thing, those are good initiatives. Uh, you know you congratulate the Congress in in saying all right look. In America, there are certain things we don't do, and there are certain things we support, and here they are in this statute. But, but to go and antagonize the the entire international sports system for 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 no particular benefit seems to me to be 
almost congressional in its <laughs> lack of understanding of the rest of the world. So I guess you weren't advising them on any of the uh, language in the in the statute. I don't know who was advising them, and uh, you know it's it, the uh, <coughs> the issues that gave rise to it are certainly serious and and, and deserving of attention, and I think that's good. But you you could have accomplished all of that without um, disrupting the international sports system. I, I, God knows what'll happen with the US coming up as a host. This is not, not the kind of um, sword of Damocles you want to have over your head when you're trying to organize Los Angeles for 2028. Uh, any, sorry, sense. my apologies for the, my voice. I'm at home and I'm therefore not used to talking so much. <laughs> <laughs> no problem at all. Um. <coughs> So another uh, another issue I'm I'm interested about, and I, I think many of uh, my, my students are, and we are at the, at NYU, uh, is on the topic of diversity and inclusion. And uh, you were I read you were quoted as saying that a a familiar mon mantra around Olympic Agenda 2020, so the the IOC's previous strategic plan was uh, change or be changed. And some of those changes had to do with uh, you know, being more inclusive and ensuring you know, more diversity in a variety of areas. And you know, I think we've seen on the, on the field that the, you know, the, there's much more like equal participation by men and women, but that's not the case necessarily in the, in the boardroom or in the conference rooms or at the highest levels of uh, the governance of, of sport organizations. So uh, what, um, what actions is the IOC taking and or what, what do you think needs to be done to, to promote a more diverse and inclusive um, you know, sport organization? Well, we're, we've certainly added a lot more women members in the last uh, <clears throat> the last few years on, on, on that, and I, I forget what percentage we're up to, but it's it, it's way over whatever the general average of, of international sports federations may be. Uh, I think if if people don't follow that um, suggestion, I think it can become it it could morph into a requirement. That you know you, you're not going to be on the Olympic program if your federation doesn't have, a, you know, a suitable uh, diversion um, element. You're not going to be, or, or you know, maybe you don't get your share of the television revenues if you if you don't meet these criteria. But the change comes hard to sport, and and usually only in the face of. Of, of an emergency or a, you know a, a, a train wreck of, of some sort so uh, you, you you use the uh, the carrot uh, as much as you can but uh, you, you got to have the stick as well and and, and and be prepared to use it all right thanks uh, thanks for that uh, so let's see I'm trying to uh, we've got lots of great questions from the from the audience and only about 10 minutes left so uh, let's see how many we can get to here. So I'm going to go to one uh, that is focused on athletes. And how do you think uh, the delay and the, the postponement of the Olympic and Paralympic Games have impacted athletes you know, psychologically and their mental health and you know, preparing for a games at which you know, maybe their friends and family and people from their home, home country can't uh, attend. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things going on that uh, that are going to impact athletes and their uh, performance at at the games. What? Uh, how big of a, an, a challenge do you think that is? Well, it's certainly a challenge, and and you know, I mean, we're not going to know until August the eighth <laughs> whether this goes off uh, well. But I mean, athletes are used to to some levels of uncertainty in, in terms of preparation, in terms of outcomes, and and. Uh, you know, depending on your your event, uh, you know, uh, a, 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 your event, if you, you get a, a slow start, that follows you all the way down to the, the finish line. So that's an uncertainty. Yes, yes. And, and you need to, uh, you need to learn to, sh to shed all the doubts and all those sorts of things that make for, for good athletes. Um, it would be somewhat upsetting, but 
but I think as you as you now know, I mean, it wasn't a question of waiting for several months to know when the games would be. It, it's exactly a, a year from what it would have been. So you're, you know, the, the sports calendar and the, and, the, and the preparation calendars remain the same. You're not going to have to do, make major adjustments to that. So as the time grows shorter, your focus gets sharper and, and you start to put all these things out of your mind as much as you can. And the most successful athletes are successful at doing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of my students asked a question about athletes who have not yet qualified for the Olympic Games, and you know, we're looking at perhaps another you know, shutdown in, in Europe, and how, I mean, how, how, is that, uh, how is that being dealt with? And I, I guess you know, that's, it's difficult for athletes. Some have qualified, they're ready to go, and other you know, athletes are not able to, you know, to train and especially athletes in team sports might not be able to interact with their teammates. What, uh, what kind of an impact do you think that's having? Well, with some, I mean, how much it's going to be, we, we really don't know. The, in, in terms of qualifications, you know, basically uh, in sports like track and field and, and swimming, the, the qualifications were never announced until about a month before the games. I mean, they're they're really, you know, up, up to uh, you know up to the minute in terms of qualification. Uh, if if the competitions aren't able to take place, that that poses a problem to the to the international federations. And the IOC has been in touch with them to say, all right, assuming that you know qualification meet A that is is uh, ready to go on July the eighth. How do you propose to, to fill up the field? And then so that whether they'll do it on a regional basis or a, a, some other kind of a, a selection process, I don't know. But I mean, they can deal with that. That's that's a that's a mechanical problem, not 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 existential. Uh, let's see. Okay, how about we've got one question following up on the diversity and inclusion question that I asked. Uh, so could you talk a little bit about the IOC's collaboration with the International Paralympic Committee uh, going forward? And I'll and I just want to note that it's the, you know it's it was exciting to see that NBC, uh, Eric, thank you, uh, if you had anything to do with it, uh, is airing, uh, you know, 1200 or so hours of the Paralympic Games this year. And that it like that far surpasses any uh, any coverage previously. So that was that was great to see. But uh, do, do you foresee the uh, IOC and IPC continuing uh, to work together and, you know, holding the Olympics and Paralympic Games at the you know, at the same time going forward? Yeah, I think I think initially with the IPC there was a lot of conflict between the IOC and the IPC, and, and you know the IPC was sort of trying to get on to the Olympic program at the same time as the Olympics, and and you have to say, look, you, you've got too many events and too many different uh, classifications of uh, of um, disabilities and so forth, and and. And, and by the way, you, you have a story that's worth telling. You, you don't want to be, uh, you know, the caboose on, on, on an Olympic uh, Games. And so get out there and, and tell your story. Uh, what we'll do is we'll make a, a condition of hosting the Olympics that the host country also has to host the Paralympics. And so that gives you the certainty of, of, of an event and the location and everything like that. And I think there may be, to some degree, a, a sharing of, of sponsorships, so that you have a, you know, it used to be that if, uh, you know, the Olympics had Coca-Cola as a sponsor, well, Paralympics would have Pepsi. Say, uh, well, uh, does that really make sense? Well, you know, it's our, these are our games, and we're going to run them our way. Um, that's that's evolved now into a, in a very close uh, cooperation. It's uh, it, it's. It, it's pretty seamless at the moment in, in terms of, of all of the consultations and, and uh, the mechanics that go with the organization of, of uh, events on this uh, scale. So I, th- I think it's, it's in a good place now. And, and I think as people understand how superb these Paralympic athletes are, uh, 
as as NBC is is going to demonstrate, the, you know that that's the, there's an audience out there for that because they're wonderful stories and and you know they're they're at least as aspirational as the Olympics. I would absolutely agree with that. So you mentioned sponsorship, so I'm going to ask one question uh, related to that. Uh, what efforts are made by the organizing committee in uh, in Japan to combat uh, ambush marketing, either the OCOG or the uh, or the IOC? What uh, what measures uh, are being taken to prevent uh, companies who are are not sponsors from trying to affiliate themselves with the event? To some degree, that's an education process. Uh, I mean, if, if there's a deliberate ambush, uh, you know, the way American Express used to do uh, with Visa, um, that's a different thing. Sometimes you you you, you go to uh, you, you have to have recourse to the courts and, and so on. But a lot of it's it's relatively innocent, and then they don't know that the you know the five rings are are a registered trademark, and then people are Olympic supporters, and they they say put that on their their building or whatever it is, and and you have to say look. You know the the marketing rights for the, the, the five rings are are, are really a, a, a big help in making it possible for these games to occur. So don't try not to diminish that uh, that value. And the other thing is is a reputational. I remember at one point with, with uh, American Express with regularly ambushed Visa. I went down to speak to the. Uh, the head of American Express, who was from Atlanta, and said, "Listen, you, you got to stop the ambushing. You know, it's just it's not right. We offered this sponsorship to you first, and you you tossed us out the door. And and then as soon as Visa got it, you realized what a mistake you'd made." And he said, "Well, I, my guys like that." And you know, the, I said, "Well, I'll tell you what. Just just so you know, I, I don't want to hide anything from you. The first occasion on which we notice." any marketing, ambush marketing by Amex, we're gonna call a press conference here in Atlanta and we're gonna get the girls gymnastics team to come and, and they're very good, they can cry on cue and they're gonna say, we don't understand why American Express is pretending it's helping Olympic athletes. So it's, it's Visa that's really doing that. Go on and on like that. I'll give the history of the relationship. And then there's gonna be a big pair of scissors on the counter, and, and I will have alerted the media to it. I'm gonna take my American Express card out of my wallet. It's expired, I, I don't use it anymore because of your ambush. And I'm gonna say, you know, I don't wanna do business with a company like this. And I'm gonna cut the card in half. I said, that photograph's gonna go around the world. And then you stop. And I, those of you who've done negotiations know very well, silence is a really, really uncomfortable situation. And it's, it can be very aggressive, which I intended it to be. And I said to myself, if, if he doesn't say anything in five minutes, I'm just going to stand up and walk out. And so one minute goes by. Minutes a long time if you're just sitting there waiting. Two minutes, three minutes. And then <clears throat> he cleared his throat. He's, and it, the, what always happens is the first one to speak is, is generally going to lose this thing. And he said, he said, you're right. You're right. You did offer it to us first. We, we, we messed up by not taking it. I'll stop the ambushing. I said, thank you very much. And out I went and we didn't have to sign anything. Uh, he was a, a, a gentleman of his word and, and it stopped. And, and so that's how you you have to protect the uh, your brand and the rights that you've granted. So I think the same thing will happen in, in Tokyo, and, and it's a I'd say it's probably a little more orderly as a society than than perhaps um, in the U.S. of A. or Canada. <laughs> You are, you are all very polite, so. Uh, <laughs> all right, so last question. And Dick, this has been such a fantastic conversation. Thanks again for joining us. That's um, fun, good questions. So, yeah, great questions from the audience. Thank you, everyone. So last question here. Uh, so from a fellow lawyer and arbitrator, 
Uh, so looking back on your incredible career in the Olympic movement, uh, what moment are you most proud of or what, what moment is this like kind of the most uh, um, outstanding and memorable for you? Well, your, your your own games are are very memorable. So so you know, coming down through the the clouds uh, in, into Rome in 1960, and you say, "Oh my God!" You know, there is a Colosseum, there is a Vatican. You'd seen pictures of them, but not. I would say one of the uh, the most memorable moments was was the closing ceremonies of Seoul in 1988. There were so many problems uh, with those games and the and the politics and and so forth and and the, the, the two Koreas and, and getting past the boycotts of, of, uh, of Montreal, of Los Angeles and, and so forth, that uh, pulling that off um, was really a, a, almost a miracle in, in terms of, uh, of, of international interchange. So that, that was pretty special. All right. Well, on behalf of everyone who attended today and NYU and the Tisch Institute for Global Sport, again, thank you so much for your time and your insights and the uh, really engaging conversation. Oh, well, thank you for having me. It's been fun. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, everyone.